My esteemed guest today has been called the most beautiful soprano voice in the world, and that voice belongs to the one and only Renee Fleming. She is one of the most highly acclaimed singers of our time, honored with five Grammy Awards and the U.S. National Medal of Arts. She also became the first classical artist ever to sing the national anthem at the Super Bowl in 2014. And in 2023, Renee Fleming became a Kennedy Center honoree, along with Sir Barry Gibb and Billy Crystal and Dionne Warwick, just to name a few. And in recent years, Renee has become a leading advocate for research at the intersection of arts, health, and neuroscience. And as artistic advisor to the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, she launched the first ongoing collaboration between America's National Cultural Center and the National Institutes of Health. And in her new book, Music and Mind, Harnessing the Arts for Health and Wellness, and she curates a collection of essays from leading scientists, artists, and healthcare providers about the powerful impacts of music and the arts on our health and the human experience. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's welcome our very esteemed guest today, five-time Grammy winner and author, the one and only Renee Fleming to the show. Welcome, Renee. Thank you, Ward. It's great to be with you today. Well, how old were you when music made that lasting impression on you, which, well, became your life's calling? Definitely before I spoke, because my mother taught piano and voice lessons, and I think I was in a playpen under the piano. So, yeah, I, it, it, it was my first language. Well, where did your interest in music and its power on the mind and body actually begin? Um, I would say, you know, I became interested as a young professional because I was having pain, uh, which related to performance pressure, audition pressure, you know, this feeling of, of being judged every time I sang. Um, not, not many people have a job where you you actually are, have a review in the newspaper the next day after you do your job. So um, I, I just started reading about mind-body connection, all the other neuroscience articles that came up, and I discovered that scientists were researching music and the brain. Well, so I, 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 you know, I met Dr. Francis Collins and asked him why. And what did he say? Well, he was then uh, director of the National Institutes of Health, uh, and we met at a dinner party in Washington, D.C. when I was, had just started as advisor to the Kennedy Center. And he said, we have a brain initiative that's relatively new, and its music is in every known mapped area of the brain, which is, the universe's most complex uh, object, and we want to understand why. And music is a really wonderful way into learning about the brain. Well, don't you find it fascinating that music has the ability to create images in our mind, uh, heightening our imagination? Uh, music is the foundation of the many colorful images that we see, well, in our brain. So for you, what was the first thing you learned about music and its actual connection to our brain? Well, you know, what was fascinating to me, uh, for instance, were, were some of the techniques and some of the interventions that have been developed by music therapists and researchers that really work. And one of them is um, melodic intonation therapy, which is fascinating because it's singing, it's using singing and the brain's plasticity to enable someone to speak who is, has aphasia because singing is in a different area of the brain than speech. So, and this works sometimes in one session. I mean, it's miraculous. I got to see it. And the other one is that, you know, in, in uh, late stage dementia and Alzheimer's disease, music is the last memory to go. So I, my husband's aunt uh, didn't know the people around her, didn't open her eyes uh, and didn't mo wasn't moving at that point. But if you sang, I'm looking over, she would sing the entire song, word perfect. And there are about four songs like that. So, you know, the scientists are trying to unravel this. Why is this? You know, you bring up a very interesting point. A few years ago, um, I had the opportunity to attend Glenn Campbell's 80th birthday party. <gasps> wow. And at, and at the time, he was in assisted living care, you know, uh, because of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I learned from his wife, Kim, and, and other researchers even though he lost, you know, of course, as the memory fades. For Glenn, one of the, the last 
things that remained was music. He still knew how to pick up the guitar and, and play it. It was the very last thing that faded away before he passed. And it's amazing. It, and you know this, I know this, it shows <clears throat> how powerful music is to the brain, the way that it maps the brain, remaps the brain in older adults. Because, you know, before our interview, is, is like I'd mentioned to you, I always encourage parents to have their children learn music. Maybe it's a musical instrument. Maybe it's singing, but at the same time, learning to read music. Because if one learns to play an instrument and learning to read music, they're using their eyes, their hands, could be using their voice. There's so many of their senses, their ears, because I have a daughter who learns instantly by ear. I have a son who likes to read the music. So everybody learns in their own way, but it, it's amazing the power uh, of music when one takes time to learn it. No, it's absolutely true. And and I just want to call out also Tony Bennett, who was incredible to the end of his career, singing like up, up the storm. But childhood development is these, these, this is a very strong area of research and what they've discovered so far. I mean, and these are baby steps in terms of, you know, high level research that's accepted by the National Institutes of Health. But they've discovered that there are lasting changes in the brain after two years of music study. And we know intrinsically from experience that kids learn self-discipline and focus, but they also learn how to tune out extraneous noise, which can be incredibly useful in the classroom. So there are a couple of chapters in my book that really focus on that. And there's a whole section that's about childhood development. So I encourage any parent to look at this. Yeah. And it's also true too, that if children learn uh, to play a musical instrument, that they actually show higher test scores than children who don't. That's right. And they also are, do better in, in life. They, they go on, they, they have secondary education. And, you know, there are, there are a lot of, that's, that there are many statistics, but the actual brain imaging is also borne up extremely well. I mean, I, I think also, you know, we're so, unfortunately today, uh, we, don't, we understand that it's not ideal, but children end up doing a lot of passive experiencing, looking at a screen. And so the active engagement, and you are so right, the listening, translating what's on the page to the fingers or the voice, and you add for voice foreign languages sometimes, it's incredibly useful for, for brain development. And one of the biggest blessings, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, the pandemic, but there were blessings that were birthed from the pandemic. One of them was music because the, and I'm going to use this, use this as an example. The guitar industry was hurting very badly. So when the pandemic hit and people are at home, kids are whining, you know, I don't have anything to do. People got bored with the whole staring at their phone thing. So people started getting outside. People started exercising. Then other from children to adults started to say, hey, uh, instead of sitting around wasting my time, let me make good use of it. Let me learn something new. And many people started learning music. Could be a guitar, could have been piano or, or drums. And then that industry actually was blessed by increased sales and a resurgence. And now these kids are like, man, I would rather play guitar all day than sit around on my phone. So there, yeah. there are some great pauses that came from that downtime that people decided to choose, well, to be constructive. Well, let's fast forward 15 years and see what superstars are created from, the, from this actual initiative of learning music. It's also fabulous for us as we age. We were talking a lot about creative aging and about really developing the brain and, and maintaining brain health as we age. And we have to have cognitive reserve, which means if when things go downhill, we'll have been so active in terms of our cognition that we have this reserve. So learning an instrument is a phenomenal way of doing that. Or, but the other thing that's fun now is a lot of research supports singing in a choir. 
it, it actually helps us with mental, you know, with mental health, you know, more, so much with postpartum depression. Um, singing also uh, alleviates, it, it helps vascular health for those in some form of cardiovascular uh, uh, decline. So there are a lot of benefits from singing too, which I rather love. I love that. You know, and one of the things that I learned in your book as I was reading it, and it reminded me of something that I had learned from another researcher. And you you mentioned the you mentioned hearing in your book. And one of the things that I learned was that our hearing is the last sense to go before we pass away. A reason why doctors and nurses will tell tell families to speak to their dying loved ones as they can hear you when all the other senses cease to operate. And, but you discovered that our hearing is one of the last researched senses, which I found fascinating. Uh, what did you learn about that discovery? It's because it's not tangible. You know, if we're talking about sight, we can see what's in front of us. It's very tangible, um, touch, tangible. Hearing is a little bit more uh, mysterious. We, we, come we become very much aware of it when, when leaf blowers are, are going strong or when we're walking down a dark street late at night alone. So then we're, we're suddenly very tuned in. So um, yeah, but it is so interesting. Nina Krause's chapter. Uh, but for me, the way in is really Ani Patel's work on evolution. So when you think that, that we actually uh, spoke after we were already probably vocalizing and singing and, and, and kind of the Neanderthal had the same vocal mechanism that I do. So my, my running joke is, you know, I wonder what their operas were like, but it, it's, you know, it, it definitely is part of our DNA, visual art. All of this has been currently discovered to be at least a hundred thousand years old. That's really old when you think that modern history is only about 10,000 years. So it, it's, it's extraordinary that this has been with us and that we don't evolve quickly. We're certainly not evolving quickly enough given what's happening in our world in terms of technology, et cetera. So it's good to hang on to these things that are meaningful to us, some kind of aesthetic experience. I, this year, am making sure I do something that feeds my soul every day. And it's making me a much happier person. I love that. I love that. And, you know, on the subject of hearing, uh, you know, like I just mentioned, there are people that can learn by ear. There are those that learn by doing or reading. Uh, I, this is a few years ago. I, I had the opportunity to interview world-renowned guitarist Steve Vai. And he can spend 30 minutes to an hour a day just doing ear training, which I found really phenomenal because to sit there and, and to listen to notes and to learn what those notes are without playing them uh, really uh, adds to one's talent, I would say. Well, Luciano Pavarotti, probably the greatest tenor in the 20th century, did not read music. Paul McCartney, of the Beatles, everybody knows who Paul McCartney is, does not read music. So it, it's not a, a, a gateway to talent. Talent is kind of another thing. And frankly, you know, people get to music and, and to accomplishments in music through many different avenues. It's easier if you learn how to read music because then you have a common language with other musicians, but it's certainly not necessary. You know, I agree with that. Now you did a, an exhaustive study in your book on music therapy, which is backed by some very compelling research. How many researchers and medical experts did you interview while doing the research for your book? Well, what's interesting is I met some of them the very first time we had a convening at the National Institutes Health of Health, and this was in um, 2017, and it was the first time actually that music therapists had even been in the building. So this was a conversation, a new conversation. And since then they funded $50 million in research on music in the brain. But music therapists, uh, there, are, there aren't enough. You know, I, I know many of them and AMTA, the American Association of Music Therapists is in, based in Maryland, close to where I live. But there, we need many more creative arts therapists to, to kind of fuel this growing field. And, and frankly, it's a movement. 
because people, as they learn about this, the response is, oh, I get it. I understand why this is powerful. I've seen it in my children or in my, my aging parents, or I feel better when I listen to music. So just listening to music can increase your dopamine levels in the brain and reduce anxiety. Really any artistic experience for 45 minutes reduces anxiety by 25%. You know, and we're very concerned about mental health in the world. And we also, of course, are terribly concerned about social cohesion. So singing together, you know, doing, creating art together is a fabulous way to develop relationships. Well, what have you learned in the medical field when it comes to music therapy? Are more doctors starting to recommend music therapy for things like people with MS, p dementia, pain relief? I mean, the list goes on, or is it still a bit in its infancy? So they are starting to, they're seeing it in children's hospitals, how important it is. I think every children's hospital should have a creative arts studio because it helps children and they need, and as, a, as a result, they need less medication, um, less sedatives for various, you know, for any number of things, because their sedatives are very dangerous for children. And then of course helps the families of, the, of everyone. Palliative care, it's extremely important. So definitely people are using it there. But Houston Grand Methodist has a great chapter uh, in the book about all the different ways that they're utilizing uh, music therapy. So for instance, with long COVID and breathing issues, Pulmonary health is hugely affected by learning how to sing and or just adopting some of the breathing exercises that we use. So I tried to share that uh, actually in an initiative um, on Google Arts and, and Culture on, uh, called Healing Breath. So if you want to go and see a bunch of superstar singers, favorite breathing exercises for, for especially and helps anybody. We all need to breathe well and breathe deeply. Um, so all, yeah, there are so many things that music therapists do that are, are filtering into healthcare. My goal, I, and I think ultimately is to have the arts embedded in healthcare altogether. It's very cost effective. It saves so much money. It improves morale, but there are also many interventions that are healing movement disorders, Parkinson's. So people with Parkinson's or traumatic brain injuries can sometimes have difficulty walking. Again, utilizing the plasticity of the brain, strong rhythm or strong music can help people bypass all that freezing and, and, and shuffling and walk smoothly and gracefully. Well, you bring something up because Parkinson's is basically where the, the dopamine is, is no longer being produced from the area of the brain called the substantia nigra. So by listening for Parkinson's patients to listen to music, it does have a way of boosting dopamine levels naturally, correct? That's right, absolutely. And it and it 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 is it works immediately. It's amazing. And I've seen people in classes. I took a class at the Kennedy Center to try it. It's a seated class because it's safer for Parkinson's patients. And there were some guys in the, in the class who were having a ball. And if you ask them if they ever danced before in their lives, they would say not a single time. And I'm loving this. So I highly recommend Dance for PD. I love that. I, lo I love that so much because your book answers a ton of questions for the mainstream audience, those that may need to seek new therapies, if it's dementia, Parkinson's, MS, pain. And, and your book is, I'm absolutely overjoyed that you spent the time to bring this information together because we need more of this. Like you said, there are not enough music therapists out there and we have millions of people right now who could actually benefit from what they can do. You are so right. You are absolutely right. And that was my goal with this was to advocate for uh, what I see happening, which is so powerful. And yet most people are unaware. So one thing I would love to get started is something we're calling art care, which would be to embed by zip code local initiatives that are already available to people that they're they're not aware of, whether it's lessons for children or a stroke choir. I mean, you know, if you if you join a choir and you've had a stroke, a, you're having fun, and B, there's no stigma, and C, you can really improve your, your uh, skill set. So there are just so many beneficial things, and every performing arts center offers 
initiatives for children with special needs and um, people with uh, dementia and their caregivers. Caregivers, that's another area of need in this country, offering solace to them and a, and a respite with the people that they care for. So uh, yeah, there's tremendous need. I'm so happy that you're, you're talking about this subject. Thank you. Well, um, I talked to a friend of yours yesterday who happens to be a friend of mine, uh, Mary Lou Falcone. And oh. I, I know that there is a, and I'm calling it a beautiful new documentary coming soon called Facing the Wind about uh, Lewy body dementia and the caregivers. And you brought up caregivers and even knowing that the music can help them. Well, and it's interesting because Mary Lou's film, uh, my understanding is that they, they didn't know what story they were going to tell. And it ended up being so much about the caregivers because the stress on them is just untold. It's, it's, it's incredible. And I went through this this past couple of years with my own mother. And, uh, and when I asked people, what, what services are there? What's available? People said, nothing. You, you need to take her home. So it's we really um, have a deficit in this country, and when you think that that our aging population, which is which is our baby boomers, uh, is going to increase exponentially in the next few years, we have to start thinking about this in a serious way. Very much so, and I, and I'm glad that you brought up dance. Uh, I had the opportunity a few months back to screen an unreleased film documentary that will be coming out, I believe, next year in 2025 called I Hope You Dance. And and it's basically based off the actual song from Leanne Womack. But there's a section in the film where they went to a homeless shelter. And a lot of the pe people who are homeless, you know, um, and they're down on their luck, they can't find a job. And then, but then they get used to being in the system. So then they don't really have the confidence and the courage to get out to restart their life and to, and to not be homeless. And I'm not talking about those that are dealing with mental health issues, just people down on their luck, lost everything, and they're homeless. So one of the people in the homeless shelter started creating this um, little dance circle and brought in the people that would participate. And as time went on, the singing, the dancing, actually created confidence and courage and these people who were able started to say, started to go out and fill out job applications to get a job and then start earning their way out of the shelter. And I thought it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. Just singing and dancing created confidence and courage. Wow, that is so amazing. And this is why we have to have arts in schools, because with, with teens, it gives them a sense of identity and being self-expressive definitely gives them uh, confidence. You're so right. I mean, California has a deficit right now of 15,000 uh, arts educators, K through 12. So unfortunately, young people have gotten the message in recent years that there are no jobs, that people have cut, well, it just happened in Florida. People are cutting arts education in public schools, but it's really, it's not a good idea because truancy is another huge problem we have. And so getting kids to go into school it requires them to really do something they enjoy as well. But I'm so, I'm gonna watch this documentary. I'm so happy you talked about that, but that's, that's incredible. Yeah, it's not out yet. I, I, I was allowed to do the very early, early screening of the documentary and it blew me away. And it's very emotional. Uh, so there are some sections of the film that will make you grab the Kleenex. Uh, oh, but but I agree with you. You know, one of the things that, that really pains me is how school systems are cutting out the arts, especially music. I mean, when I was a kid in elementary school, oh my gosh, I hated choir. Yeah, I was just one of those, not knowing that as I as I grew up, I'd be, you know, involved with more people in the music industry. But it's very important for the development because I've heard stories from recording artists that said if it wasn't for the music program at school or a music program at their church or at uh, some civic center, they would have never become the star that they were today. 
Well, you're right. And and frankly, Herbie Hancock told me that if we, if we cut these programs, we won't have jazz musicians in the future because they won't have learned those instruments. In my favorite class in middle school, I'm looking behind you, was guitar class. And boy, did I play guitar all through high school and college and became pretty good at it, actually. I'm so sorry I sold my guitar at one point. Uh, but it, it's, you know, music doesn't have to be something that kids don't enjoy. It can be, ideally, it's something that they make. If you can teach a kid how to write lyrics and how to create a hip hop track and how to kind of, you know, make create things themselves or in a group, that's probably where they want to live right now. I completely agree. And I feel that for some that, like you said, what's going to, what are we going to see 15 years from now? Because I'm a bit worried that some of the most talented young people on this planet will never be heard and may never find out that they have a talent that can bless the world. You're absolutely right. And frankly, even if they don't, the benefits for lifelong for this kind of engagement with with whether it's painting or art making or or weaving or or definitely making music are so tremendous and they've been proven now recently in very powerful ways very much so now you also covered a a you have a chapter in your book about uh pain relief and of course we have a massive opioid epidemic in this country and I learned from your book that reduced pain levels during spine surgery by 46% and more, and that's through music? That's right. I mean, it's amazing. I actually have a friend who had a brain bleed not long ago. It wasn't a, an aneurysm. It was a different type, but she was in excruciating pain. And she was advised, of course, not to turn on any screens, to kind of sit in the dark. And somebody said, well, you can listen to music. She listened to, she, she kind of rolled around, you know, in a, in a playlist and found that the only thing that alleviated her pain was Jimi Hendrix as loud as she could possibly play it. And if the volume came down or it turned off, the pain came flooding back. So I sent this to some neurologists who uh, I work with at the National Institutes of Health. And I said, what do you make of this? And they said, Okay, they sent me back a study with a picture, an fMRI of a brain in excruci in huge pain, had big blue circles and then big red circles around it. That same person listening to music, all the red circles were gone. So the pain was much reduced. So it, it, there's no question there are huge benefits of listening to music on, when you have pain. And you answered a very important question in your book about that because it's not the distraction because people think well if you distract them they're not going to think about their pain but it's really not about distraction is it it's more than that exactly there's an, a mechanism in the brain that occurs that that really does have sound actual sound that you appreciate that works for you and this is all really personal you know you have to kind of work with a therapist to just to discover what the best music is for it or what's best sounds are so it, it but it definitely it, science is still wrestling with pain it's a relatively new focus for science and technology better betterment of technology is making it possible for them to understand but but we really do have a pain epidemic in the world and of course a mental anguish ep epidemic as well so there, people are quite focused on this at the moment well, did you study or look at any graphs or charts or computer data on um, brain frequencies like beta and theta and alpha? Yes, because there's an amazing initiative at MIT that has discovered that a, a, pic, a particular 40 hertz vibration, both in sound and light, can help the brain clean up amyloid plaques and tangles. I mean, it's remarkable. I mean, I said, I said, so in other words, in a few years, we're gonna to go to CVS and get into a booth and have our, our brain hygiene performed. So they, they are just, and they've also just discovered that brain waves are uniform across many layers of the brain and uniform amongst all mammals. And the scientist who kind of presented this said he, he couldn't believe that no one's discovered this before. It was kind of in plain view. So there will be tons of research around brainwaves in the future. I mean, not the, not the sort of what we're seeing on 
in on YouTube of, you know, this will help you study better, but, you know, really rigorous science around this very subject. Well, you know, I, I years ago, um, I was doing studies on research of the brain and learning and focus. And mm. um, a lot of people don't know about the, the salt flotation tanks. And, you know, back in back in the 70s into the 80s, some of the NFL players would use saltwater flotation tanks and have a television screen placed at the very top of the tank. So when they're floating looking up, they're replaying their best plays. What they found out was when they got onto the field, they didn't make mistakes because they had that image of themselves replaying the perfect play every single time over and over the whole time that they were in the tank. And That's so... So it shows that by lowering alpha brain waves and increasing focus and reducing stress, we can do some great things. That is fabulous. I love that. You know, I, I learned at a very young age to use this imagination technique to imagine myself on stage singing the perfect high C. And I, yeah, I did that in advance of a major competition, but I did it for a number of weeks and it really worked. Because I did go on stage, I was able to do what I had intended to do. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think people don't even understand the power of the brain and using it for good, for positive, and a positive effect on our performance. So, I, if, you know, 15,000 educators were looking. We, we talked about that, but I also wanted to say that creativity is something that we should begin measuring to discover who will succeed. It should start to be part of college admissions. It should start to be part of how we, how we really judge our young people in looking at their futures, because this is something that's been completely under the radar when we're talking about education in terms of STEM or STEAM. But if you think about STEAM kind of engendering that sort of creativity, that I find that athletes were doing that in a tank, that is extraordinary because it's training us for high performance. Yeah, so, one and of that's the imagination. You have to imagine that. Oh yeah, because one of the um, gosh, again, late late seventies, early eighties, I believe, uh, one of the the best field goal kickers for the Dallas Cowboys did that and went a whole season and never missed. Wow! And so that's how much thought he put into that. As for me, I mean, I use music to help me focus when I'm writing a couple of hundred interviews a year. It helps me to maintain my focus, but it also can help prevent writer's block. You know, I I, I had this really fun interview with uh, 70s rock legend John Ford Coley from England and John Ford Coley. And we got the laughing because we both love yacht rock, but there is a frequency, there's this middle of the road tone within those types of songs that calm you down. It makes you feel good. You stay upbeat and happy. Uh, and for me, it just allows me to focus that much more. Wow. That's amazing. That's, that's fabulous. So, you know, there are so much potential on um, focused ultrasound, for instance, which those are sound waves can now um, really help patients with glioblastoma, which is a terrible brain cancer, and can operate on that brain cancer without ever cutting through the skull. So, and they're using it for Parkinson's now and for uh, tremor. So there, there are just so many increasingly non-invasive uses of sound waves. Uh, so we're, it's just gonna keep getting better and better. Yeah, very much so. And I know that you had studied things like dementia, like you'd mentioned Parkinson's. And, you know, I, uh, when Mary Lou sent me the trailer for that film and, and I watched it, the biggest thing about Lewy body dementia is that the patient's moods can change abruptly. You know, some of them can get very agitated. And I, and I found that through your book that improved moods among dementia patients can be uh, improved by 59% with the use of music. You know, at the end of the Kennedy Center Honors, uh, a woman came up to me just as we were all leaving and she said, I saw you give a talk 
and we were having a terrible time with our father who was starting to have sundowning, become almost violent and really difficult and agitated uh, with his dementia. And we remembered thinking about your talk that he had been an opera lover. And so we put on opera, he calmed down, he smiled and we have not stopped playing it since. <laughs> So yeah, there's no question that it really makes a huge difference. Uh, and people will typically gravitate towards music that they loved in their teen years. That's what typically has a, a very a powerful response in us. Yeah, th you know, that, I, that would make sense. Yeah, I mean, I I think, you know, it's, it's some late stage in life, I'll be singing all these operas that were incredibly hard to learn, like in, in Czech and, and Russian and these languages that are that I had to learn by rote. So that's my running joke about uh, what is circling around in my brain, because you never forget them. That's the amazing thing. It's all still there. You know, our memory lives in a part of the brain that's very deep. It's in the stem and it's also quite ancient. So this is one of the reasons why one scientist is saying he believes that uh, we have this, this music memory that lasts for so long. It's because it's such an ancient part of the brain. And like you said, the ability, well, to know music, to learn music, the ability to play music for, th for those that do, it lasts forever till the very end. If they end up right. with dementia, it's the very last thing, as you and I have discussed, to go. Because I believe, like you said, it's so deep-seated in the part of the brain that it's always it's always there it's always alive even if they have no clue about their surroundings music still lives and that's how powerful this is now there is a statement in your book that really kind of blew me away and uh Navala said every disease is a musical problem every every cure a musical solution you believe that I think it can really make a difference. I do. I mean, when you think that the research is kind of uh, in early steps, I, I think there's a lot that affects us that we don't even understand yet. When I walk outside and I'm in nature, I feel a wave of transcendence. I Just the smell of it, it, it really is very healing to me. Uh, nature also in, increases awe. That sense of awe in us is something that science is really studying now because it's so good for us. Music does that too. Um, art does that. So there are chapters in my book on architecture and the visual arts and, and dance as well as music. Although music has had this, the, probably the, has the strongest foundation of research at this point, but all of these aesthetic experiences are powerful. Uh, and, and, we, we underestimate them in science. So, so one of the, one of the thing that it's something that a palliative expert said to me recently, he said, you know, um, medicine is incredible and we all are grateful for medicine. I certainly am. And I, I hope these innovations continue to come at a rapid pace as they have. But he said, medicine treats disease, not people. And so if we remember who we are as human beings and what has driven us over our history, then we really come back to the arts. Yes, very much. So I always encourage people to at least uh, get outside for at least 50, at least 15 minutes a day. Get breathe some real air, not the air in your house. And and if you and if you have a nice decent yard, take your shoes off and go stand in the grass because there's a healing property even to the uh, electromagnetic field of the earth that can flow through our body. The research is astounding on that. And uh, I mean, look, I, you, you do it. I do it. A lot of us do it. We have to get away from our devices to clear our right. head. And nature is the best thing to do that with. Well, Barbara King Solver and Richard Powers gave a lecture recently, two great writers, Pulitzer Prize winning writers. And Richard Powers has a chapter in the book. I, I didn't mention writers. And, and, and of course, my friend Ann Patchett. But they both said that they believe that their backyards as children turn them into creative writers because they just spent their days as young children exploring everything. I see this, I see this with young children when I see them outside. They're looking under every blade of grass and thinking about how that interacts with the insect that's crawling up. It's so good for us. You're absolutely right to be have that connection. 
Uh, and I, I definitely think that the, the research in the future will begin to kind of help us understand why this is important for us to stay connected to the world. I mean, neural arts uh, is, is kind of my favorite thing because it's, they have, Susan Max Ammon has a wonderful chapter in the book as well, and I'm a, a co-advisor to them, but it's, it starts with the umbrella of nature. It's a much bigger umbrella, these, all of these aesthetic experiences. It starts with making things with, um, their book, Your Brain on Art, was a, big, a bestseller last year. Uh, her and Ivy Ross from um, from Google, and it, it it's been very inspiring to people. It's still selling like crazy because people can you know, read it and think, "Wow, I can improve my health that much just by doodling." You know, it, there's some amazing pieces in in terms of research. Oh, anything that's creative, I think improves the body in multiple ways. So, uh, I hate. The smartphones. I think the biggest curse the, the the world has ever been given was the iPhone, <laughs> because we've trapped ourselves into something that's not beneficial to us. We have to get that's outside. Right. We have to put a guitar in our hand or put our hands on a on a piano, um, set of drumsticks, or maybe it's a cello. It doesn't matter. I mean, as long as you're doing something, your brain is going to benefit your emotions are going to benefit from it. Like you had said earlier, even our cardiovascular system will benefit right. from all of that. But you have a chapter in your book that I had to look up and I had to read and I found it so interesting, but also I think there's more questions because you have a book. I mean, you have a, a chapter about recording artist Roseanne Cash's medical issue, not just with Lyme disease, but she discovered that she had a brain malformation where it was sounds and frequencies and volumes that actually bothered her. She had a, it was in a, it's called Chiari One. She had a kind of a, a brain issue where the, the brain was coming, falling through the stem and pressing on her spinal cord. She was in tremendous pain for about 10 years. And of course, because she's a woman, very often she kind of got, well, we don't really see what's happening. We think maybe it's hormonal. To, that was unfortunately some of the, she, she told me this in an interview recently. I'm not sure she said that exactly in her chapter, but it was a long recovery. And because she's a musician, it took her a while to even gain those skills back. So it's a, it's a harrowing chapter. People magazine took an excerpt from her chapter because you just, you sit there and you think, my goodness, what she went through. And she's touring again like crazy and doing incredibly well. But I want to talk about the phone for one more second. Sure. So the, the default mode network is an incredibly important um, brain network that enables the brain to rest. And if we are constantly engaged with our phone all day long, the brain does not get that rest. And the rest used to occur uh, when we were daydreaming. If we had to wait in line, if we were walking down the street, if we were um, driving someplace, this is this daydreaming is that default mode network and it's what we need to develop creative ideas. And I think that actually when I am, never, am tethered to my phone, I feel depressed after a couple of days. It has a negative effect on my, not just because of the news I'm reading, although that's certainly part of it, but also I think it's because I never let my brain rest. You're 100% correct. And I found out too that if people will spend 72 hours, that's right, 72 hours in nature, go camping for a weekend, don't get near any technology. Pop yeah. up a tent, grab a sleeping bag, sleep on the ground. You can reset your brain in 72 hours by being away from all of the man-made technology, but receiving the, the electrical frequencies by sleeping on the ground, walking in nature, and it resets everything. I even did, did I, about, well, it's been almost two weeks. I started cutting my phone off during the day. I mean, literally off. I'm like, if you need to contact me, then you can email me. And if it's a right. text, I can see it on my computer. I didn't even want my phone in my hand. I didn't want to check any of my social medias. I can do that on the computer. And plus, you can schedule that stuff so you're not sitting there just constantly doing it and doing it. Find right. ways to get away 
from your smartphone. You know, I grew up in a time when we had a telephone hung on the wall with a cord. There was no answering machine. If it rang, right. you answered it. If not, then you basically told somebody to lie for you that you weren't home. <laughs> It's true. No, it's true. And I think it's especially important for children. Parents that I admire have set up rules with children around phone use, especially at mealtime, et cetera. And they're strict about it and they set it up very early. So kids know that this is expected of them. So I think that that that's to be commended is really trying to control that screen time with your kids. Well, I want to ask you a question, a, a very important question. When did you realize that in in your career that your music helped to bring peace and comfort and joy and happiness as well as make memories in millions of people's lives across the globe well i learned it from my fans because they would write letters they would come backstage they would show up at signings and they would say your music got me through a terrible period of loss or through cancer. I, I heard this over and over and over again. And these are people who would say, I literally listened to this album over and over. And I'm sure that's true for all the great artists today uh, that it, it becomes, it really becomes a healing presence in someone's life, especially when they're in need. Very, very much so. Ladies and gentlemen, I know music. Renee knows music is a very powerful healer, but it's also a powerful teacher. And I encourage you to buy Renee Fleming's Exhaustive, and I mean that as a great thing, an exhaustive and compelling research on music and mind, harnessing the arts for health and wellness. Her book is available right now on Amazon.com, or you can go to PenguinRandomHouse.com to buy the book as well. This is a compelling a growing body of research that has shown music and arts therapies to be effective tools for addressing a widening array of conditions, from providing pain relief, to reducing anxiety and depression, to regaining speech after a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, and improving mobility for people with disorders that include Parkinson's disease and MS. So in Music and Mind, Renee Fleming draws upon her own experience as an advocate to showcase this booming field, inviting leading experts to share their discoveries. And in addition to describing therapeutic benefits, the book explores evolution, brain function, childhood development, and technology as applied to arts and health. Much of this area of study is relatively new, believe it or not, but made possible by recent advances in brain imaging and supported by the National Institutes of Health, major hospitals and universities. This work is sparking an explosion of public interest in the arts and health sector. Renee, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your incredible book and insights with us today. I mean, may your music and your research continue to be a blessing to all of us. Thank you, Ward. What a wonderful interview. Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for watching and listening. And you can catch and watch all of the replays of our celebrity guests on our YouTube channel at Dr. Ward Bond, as well as a dozen audio channels such as iTunes and Spotify. So be sure to subscribe. And remember, music creates memories, but music provides healing in more ways than we can imagine. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.